All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So everyone, welcome to the March 2021 uh, episode of our uh, chapter meeting. Uh, tonight, we're going to have Mary Irish, who's going to be our speaker, and I'll introduce her a little bit later. Um, my name is Gary Bowers, okay. and I'm one of the members of the Williamson County chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas. We'll go through a short business presentation, and then I'll hand it over to, to Mary for her presentation. Uh, we will record this session, so if you have friends that try to join, we have a max participant of 100 guests. If you have someone that's letting you know that they're not able to join, they'll be able to watch this online later on our YouTube channel. So we'll record that. If you notice your toolbar, you're going to see the Q&A section as well as the chat. And once I'm finished with my presentation, I'll be monitoring those to, to watch that. We'll handle questions for Mary at the end of the session, unless there, we start having some technical difficulties that folks tell us about then. Okay. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. All right. So our plant of the month is Standing Cypress. And I will totally butcher that botanical name. So let's go ahead and do it. Apomopsis rubra. Uh, these have these really bright red stalks of tubular flowers. Um, we have them here at my place in the Black Lion Prairie. They're really great attractors for hummingbirds, uh, but butterflies and bees you also see. Uh, we see a lot of um, bumbles towards late summer that like to uh, nectar rob. They'll cut a little hole at the base and get the nectar out that way. They are biennial. And what that means is their first year will typically be vegetative. And then their second year is when they're going to burst up that stalk and then bloom. Now, mine tend to cheat uh, that aren't truly biennial as far as uh, calendar year goes. What I tend to see is I'll see little rosettes pop up at the end of one growing season, and then they'll bloom that next spring. So they're kind of cheating a little bit. So those are standing cypress. And I will say that I had some that were totally covered in frost uh, during the, the ice storm and they're perfectly fine now. They're pretty low to the ground this time of year. Okay. We do have the Native Plant Spring Symposium coming up. It's going to be a Zoom seminar, webinar, and that's March 10th, 13th, 10 a.m. through 3.15 p.m. You can register at nipsot.org, which is the state website. And they're going to go through uh, kind of similar to, to all of our spring symposiums. It's just all online now. Uh, you do get a discount if you're a Nipsot member or a Lady Bird Johnson Wallflower Center member. Uh, so if you're one of those, be sure to make sure you check that when you purchase your tickets. And then the big thing that we have coming up towards the end of this month is our plant sale. And I will hand that over to Beth to let her talk about that. All right, Beth. Okay, you're looking at our, um, our new location for the plant sale for this year, and we're super excited about it. Uh, this is gonna be at the main pavilion at Berry Springs. And Randy and I were out there Monday visiting it and looking at it and planning how we were gonna lay out the tables. And it is just, beautiful and it is peaceful and it is way more space than we're used to having and a good sturdy covering that we don't have to worry about blowing away in a March wind that we're really crossing our fingers it won't blow like it did yesterday for the plant sale but anyway we're just really really excited about it and I think I've got uh, a slide right there I have just sent uh, a new updated plant list to the website. You check our website all the time and I'm, I'm updating this list regularly. We've got some plants that we thought, you know, that did survive the freeze. They look great. They're going on to the sale. We have some that we thought were gonna go on for the sale, but now they're beginning to look like maybe not they're gonna make the sale. So even if the plants don't change, sometimes the sizes may change on them. So really really excited we've had a lot of people asking about oh, will we have milkweed 
And we are going to have Zazodi's milkweed. We will have over 200 four inch plants, beautiful, full in the top of the pots. This is a great one because it's one of the first ones to leaf out in the spring. So it's really important for those first uh, migrating monarchs when they come start their way back north. It's a great one for central Texas for either side of I-35. We've just found out we're gonna have some big red sage, Salvia pinstemoides, and it is uh, on the state endangered list because it's very rare in its native habitat, but it is way out into the uh, market. So there's no, uh, you're not endangering the plant by buying it. So it's been propagated and, and now pretty well offered. And we're gonna have some of that. We don't see that on the market very much. Um, We've got some beautiful Mexican plums. Can't say enough good, thing, enough good things about Mexican plum. That's Prunus. That's one of Doug Tallamy's uh, keystone genuses that he talks about. And uh, just wonderful. We'd love to see more of that out. It's a great plant for pollinators. We've got uh, fragrant mimosa. Um, and we've got a lot of different oak trees. I, you know, I encourage you to check the website. Probably tomorrow the new list will be up. Oh, and we do have a little surprise that we have not advertised, have not talked about, but Gary Bowers and Sue Wiseman, two of our most favorite plant walk leaders, are going to be leading a few little walks during the plant sale hours. So, you know, little walks around Berry Springs, talk about the plants, and they're both wonderful, enthusiastic, and very knowledgeable. So, come for that, too. That's all I got, Gary. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you for mentioning that. Sue and I are going to map out our uh, paths uh, next week. Uh, we're going to do a 15 minute walk and a 30 minute walk. And then we'll just, um, we'll try to post those uh, times based on, unfortunately, how, based on how busy we are, because Sue and I are also going to be selling plants. Uh, so we'll work out the details for that and have some more information for you next week. All right, and uh, I did see a couple of comments about the uh, the sound. Uh, Beth, were you able to hear me okay while I was talking through the first half? I can hear you fine. You're a little bit soft when you first start talking and you open the meeting, but uh, I'm used to that. So okay, got it. Um, I'm betting Mary might be a little more. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is probably me and looking at all my windows so that's right yes yeah no problem yeah. you are distracted yes okay all right just a few more slides and then we'll hand it over to mary all right so uh, this is randy just wanted us to to let you know that everybody can help uh go and subscribe to our youtube channel i'll post that uh to our chat window the new posts uh you'll get a notification when we get new posts. Though one of the big reasons that we want you to do this is once you get, uh, once we get 100 subscribers, we'll be able to have a custom URL. URL. Right now we have a long string of letters and numbers and would really like that to become Nips at Wilco, like our Facebook and our Instagram. So we have 83 current subscribers uh, and that was almost double from what we had last time. So if you're not currently subscribed to our YouTube channel, please go ahead and do that. All right. Now our upcoming programs, which will be virtual until further notice. Just enough Latin to go plant shopping with Carol Clark. That's going to be next month on April 8th. On May 13th, planting natives from seed with Anthony Falk, who's an instructor at Texas A&M Kingsville. And then in June, uh, we kind of missed the, the date there, is how to something <laughs> with Leah Turner. I think they're solidifying uh, exactly what that presentation is going to be. Um, so it'll be how to do something related to landscape design. All right. And if you have ideas for a speaker, go ahead and send those to Susie Hickman, or you can reach out to us uh, through the website. There's a couple of different uh, boxes that you can fill in and contact us. Here are all those links. So we've got our website, our YouTube. Uh, you, you can search for uh, 
Nipsat Williamson County, and you'll find us that way. Uh, we've got Facebook, Instagram. And then to join nipsat.org, there are 35 chapters in Texas. Uh, so there's probably one that's relatively close to you. Um, and then tonight, one lucky participant will receive a free book. And it's going to be in the, the Perennials for Southwest Texas by Mary Irish. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll pull a random uh, drawing at the end of the, the meeting. As long as you attend the meeting for longer than 15 minutes, then you are entered to win. And then our February winter of last month, which was for the book Ferns and um, Lycophytes of Texas, was Paula of San Antonio. All right. So again, tonight, our speaker is going to be Mary Irish, who is a Texas native, an A&M graduate, an instructor, and I'm chuckling a little bit because I was reading ahead, a radio show host. Uh, Mary, was your radio hosting about plants? Yes, indeed it was, and it was in Phoenix, Arizona, and Phoenix. it was indeed about plants, so it was a lot of fun. Okay, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, maybe we'll find you on a podcast later. <laughs> future. Discuss. Uh, Let's do that. All right. Great, great. Uh, former director of public horticulture at the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix, Arizona, and the author of multiple books and articles on dry climate gardening. And uh, I've really enjoyed getting to know Mary a little bit over the last couple of weeks as we were getting this set up. And so I am happy to turn it over to her. Mary, I will stop sharing my screen now, and then I will hand it over to you. What do I do? Okay. I'll start this, yeah. Yes, yeah, screen share at the bottom. Do I have to put share first? Yeah, go ahead. Share the screen with my here. Aha. All right, something's happening. Um, coming right along. Aha. Uh, Okay. I think we got close. Yeah. Okay, did we get there or did we not get there? Oh, there uh, we are. There we are. All right. Are we there? Try one more time. Right now I can just see your video. Meaning? <laughs> oh, sorry. You, uh, I can see you, but not what you're showing. On oh, your okay. Well, it says it's up on share, but apparently it's yeah. not. Oh, there it is. Sorry, guys. What Gary did not tell you is this is my first Zoom talk. So be excited. Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it now? I do, yeah. Excellent. Let's get rolling. Uh, what do I do? Oh, slideshow. You start your slideshow. Oh, I'd rather do it by myself. Well, come on, PowerPoint, let's move. <laughs> oh. All right. Now, ready, set, roll. Are we ready? Okay. Of course we're ready. Do you want to? Okay, perfect. Okay. Are we off? Are we ready? Yeah. Can I go? <laughs> you can tell that I really know exactly what's going on here. Well, thanks for, thanks for inviting go. me. And, and I'm really excited. I, too, am a member of the Texas Native Plant Society. And was in Arizona, the Arizona Plant Society, Native Plant Society, and and am a huge fan of plants that perform well and natives do it better than most. Uh, so, and what Gary um, probably didn't know is I used to run the plant sales at the San Antonio Botanical Garden as well, and did that for about six years. And we grew a ton of natives, many of which were on Beth's screen. So I urge you to uh, go for it. Today I'm going to talk about a project that Gary and I did in our own yard. We live in Castroville, which of course nobody knows where it is. It's 25 miles west of San Antonio on US 90. And, and we owned, we, we moved in there in 2012 and we started building a garden. And this is about the, the portion of the garden that we call the Tex-Mex border. Okay, and perennial borders are not a brand new concept. They have been around a long time. But in their previous life, this is more or less what they look like. 
They were very formal, very rigid, as you can see, very matched up kind of a look. It was extremely labor intensive, which in mid and late 19th century wasn't a huge problem. Uh, and they were, they were certainly the denizen of the rich. I mean, these, these things do not happen without a humongous staff and without a lot of bedding over and over again. Often they were turned over three or four times a year and various things like that. Now, uh, come along in sort of the latest, you know, 1870s right in there. Uh, these two folks decided, well, we could do better. The man on the left was named William Robinson. He was a very prominent horticulturist and landscape designer at the time in England. And this, of course, is Gertrude Jekyll. And don't we all wish we look like that? I mean, honestly, she's fantabulous. She too was a landscape, a garden designer and very well known, wrote many books. And they both, thought, not necessarily together at first, but simultaneously came up with the idea that things could be a little looser, that perennials had a lot going for them because you didn't have all this bedding out stuff. You didn't have to change them out. They lasted for many years in most cases, and certainly over a couple of growing seasons. And they liked that sort of what, what they called the cottage look, which was a more flowing and, and loose kind of thing. That took off and became what we call today perennial borders, which are much more common. This one is in North Carolina and is a stunning example that's huge at the Ralston Arboretum. But this is an example of what they were going for in a big border. Now they offer, they also were very interested in people being able to do it right at a small house, you know, where it would just be, I don't know, a couple of dozen plants maybe, or something of that type. But the idea was is that you mixed, as you can see from this, and if you if you imagine yourself standing in the middle, it goes small, medium, large, and then a great big backdrop. Uh, and that was kind of the British model. And that model moved to the United States, especially the Eastern United States, wholesale. And often incorporated those plants, the very same plant uh, that, that they would use in England and, and so forth and so on. So, and this is a little bit more, this is in Dallas, a little bit more scaled version that would be more like in your yard uh, as, as was ours. You know, uh, a sort of height uh, dependent still low, medium, and high. The high is not so high, and the backdrop doesn't have to be that towering bunch of evergreens that was really predicted by uh, the way the British did it, the, the way it was done over there. So, so we decided, when we moved to Castroville, our yard almost looked like that, but not quite. We decided that what we had wanted to do for a long time was to build a perennial border of native plants. And I tried one in Arizona that didn't really work out very well and uh, at the Desert Botanical Garden. But here we said, well, we've got enough room and plenty of great plants. And so let's give it a shot. So we did. I am standing at our back porch with our dining room behind me and our, that vegetable garden in front of it. And this is 75 feet long. And it starts out about five and a half feet wide and ends up being five feet wide. And I think you got a handout, or anyway, I'll talk about it. You can do a lot of things in a big border like this to kind of shift perspective. And by shrinking the width just a little bit towards the end, it makes it seem even longer and bigger than it is. Which is just sort of just a visual trick, but it's, but it's kind of nice. So we set out the same way anybody sets out anything. The red flags indicate the back of the border, which we use this plain black plastic, I don't know what it's called even, border liner, and it undulates. But this, as you can see, this path here is rigid and very, very straight. And those are cedar logs to, uh, now that, so that was how it started. And, you know, you just plop the plants around. And four years later, this is what it looks like, or looked like, until of course the big freeze. We don't discuss that. And, um, but, but you can see that it, it involves a lot of the principles of good perennial borders. And many of them are demonstrated right here. And we'll talk about a few more of them too. One of them is textural contact, uh, contrast. And you can see that the nolinas here in the very front are very different looking than the leafy frothy perennials behind them. Some things are very tall, uh, that big tall with the big wide leaves is a butylon from the valley. 
uh, you can see that there's different colors. There was a, there was a, or there is, I guess I should say, a, a kind of principle that often, if you read books about perennials, especially if they come out of England, and they come out of the Eastern United States, they talk about color drifts. And some, per, some perennial beds are really astonishing. They go through the spectrum. You know, they start with one color and they move through. And we decided that was worthless. And we just started splashing color around that looked like it would work. And uh, so you can see that it's very colorful um, and it's very um, mixed, I guess I would say. Perennials in general have a kind of rounded, frothy look. So you have to kind of pay attention to the, uh, that gray on the left of your screen is a globe mallow, for example. And then over here is a gara on the right hand side next to it. So the white of the gara or whitish. And the white leaves of the, um, of the globe mallow really pop out. And they make for these great contrasts. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a lot of visual interest and a lot of contrast. And so you sort of pay attention to, and we'll talk about height too, but you're talking about different heights and different uh, textures, both in the leaf and different flower color as well. This particular bed is in full or unrelieved sun. And it is very important to pay attention to that if you're laying one out or the reverse, you know, if it's totally in the shade, you gotta have plants that are gonna perform in the conditions under which they're growing. So that, you know, that really helps. This bed ends in our vegetable garden, which runs perpendicular to it. And that gate back there isn't, a, it isn't really a gate, Gary built it uh, to look like a gate, but it, it performs another visual function if you're, especially if you're doing a linear bed like this. And that is, is, is a destination for your eye. You can use this very same principle on much smaller uh, perennial borders by a door going up to your doorway, a driveway going up to the garage, if you will, or, or a piece of art or a, a, you know, of a very important plant, a very unusual or important uh, plant, anything that kind of pulls your eye all the way down. This is especially effective in linear uh, borders like this. And while I have this up, I'll show you, borders don't have to be linear. You know, you can easily have one that arcs around, say you have a small piece of lawn and it can define the edge of that and separate it from the rest of your garden. So that, the, so that whatever small lawn you may or may not have looks like it's enclosed. You know, it's kind of a boxed in as it were, but it's boxed in by something very, very handsome. Pools, around pools, around patios, seating areas, cook, outdoor cooking areas, anything. They don't have to, be, this one is, but they don't have to be long, linear, and straight. They can be curved, they can be round, they can be anything. But what they want to achieve is blocking out what's behind them to some extent. You want to pay attention to what's right there. And they want to have these principles of small, medium, large color, lots of contrast uh, going forward. So, and this, this is just another example of how contrast can work. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side, this is that great Salvia Farinaceae selection known as Henry Gulberg. Now, Henry is a wonderful plant for a border like this because he's big and he's ruthless. I mean, you can't kill this plant. It does, well, maybe the freeze did, but probably not. But he's very big, you know, and, and so he can kind of be the border between the medium-sized perennials and the very large plants in the back. And he blooms a long, long period of time. Now, he, he survived the freeze, but he won't be as tall as this for a few months, you know. Hey, Mary. Uh, and you can see the big leaves behind him, that, that um, rebutalon, I think, behind him with big leaves, little leaves, linear leaves. Notice how different the leaves are in the left-hand image. In the right-hand image, it has more to do with color. That's Pavonia, the Gallardia. Now the Gallardia is an introduction that we did not do. <laughs> what are you doing? Gallardia is bringing itself um, along, just came with the ride. It is annual, and we don't really support a whole lot of annuals in this bid, but Gallardia is one we will accept. Because he blooms a long period of time, he looks really good. Uh, behind him is the skeleton leaf golden eye, and they're they're just marvelous. And this palm that you see behind it is actually in the bed behind. He isn't really technically part of this bed, visually is, 
but technically it, it's planted uh, elsewhere. Mary, just real quick. So, certainly. Um, there's a little bit of a delay when you change slides. Yeah. So if you'll change the slide awesome. and then pause for just a second. Slow down. Uh, that'll let people sure. catch up. I'd be happy to. And then Did I also want to back? clarify, I, I think we're good for now, uh, but I, I also wanted to clarify that Mary's husband's name is also Gary. So <laughs> I haven't built any fences or uh, gates at Mary's Thank place. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point, yeah. So this is one of your handouts and it just repeats some of the principles that work in creating a, uh, a very effective perennial border or perennial bed really, but and that is to vary the leaf size, the shape, the color, and the texture, the color the same way, and the heights the same way. It makes all the sense in the world, but you wouldn't believe how many times this is violated. The little ones go in the front, the medium ones in the middle, and the large ones in the back. You think of it as a continuum. You're kind of trying to move them along a continuum. Rarely use the, uh, which was the old technique, really, of matching plants side by, um, across the path from each other. They look like soldiers up marching along the way. That it, you should use that very judiciously and very carefully and not really a whole lot. It doesn't really improve things in my view. The other thing, and sometimes we violate this ourselves, but we try not to definitely believe whatever people like me tell you about how big the plant's gonna be. And plant them so that when they mature, they kind of touch so that they, they shade what's below which helps with weed control and but they don't overhang each other you know they don't they don't impinge on each other to the point where you lost it uh, so be so be aware of that in a large planting and i'll show you one or two and talk about some in a minute you can use very large woody plants as part of the background or as accents uh, or you could use a small tree in it depending on how your border is set up as like that focal point I talked about, or as a centerpiece, uh, if it's more rounded or something like that. Uh, and then again, the idea of putting something dramatic at the end of a long linear bed or any linear bed really, uh, to pull your eye in and, and watch out for the exposure. But now watch out for the delay, four, five, six. Now what I'm gonna do now is go through some of the plants that we have. We have over 80 species in that bed all but five of which are native to Texas. The other five are native to adjacent Mexico and we simply love them. And they, and they, they perform well. Uh, one of them is in this show, the others, you know, we can talk about it if you like. But um, they're, they're fabulous. The one on the left is the name is the 10 petal anemone. And this plant came without our intervention. We had about six in one, another part of the yard. And they have the much de like dandelions have, they have those little puffy uh, seeds with uh, ons all over them. And it has spread magnificently. This is blooming right now. And that is a February bloomer. And now it's little carpets of it in certain selected parts of the, of the perennial bed when it is actually not at its most colorful or its most vivid. So it's a wonderful little bulb and you know, it'll, it'll bloom for now, it'll grow for a couple of months and then it disappears and it comes right back. The one on the right is, some people call it straggler daisy. Some people call it horse herb. Again, it just kind of came with the place and we tend to leave it where it is a congenial because it's an excellent ground cover and takes no care, no care whatsoever. And so fighting what was originally in this yard, which was nothing but Bermuda, uh, this is a big help. Uh, so that's helped a lot. The other came with the place on a ground cover is two-tone, which is related to uh, all justicia. It is a justicia. And this is also a really fine late spring summer bloomer. Uh, if we have good summer rains, it'll bloom all summer. You know, and we don't really encourage it that much. I mean, we just like let it do its thing. But again, it does the same thing as the straggler days. It's an excellent ground cover and an excellent weed barrier uh, underneath. It's nice to have something that kind of makes like a carpet under the larger perennials uh, without having to do, have too much grief about it, you know. And of course, we planted wine cup. Who could not want wine cup? 
Now, what wine cup for us is a little bit different. It, it doesn't spread the way the, the daisy, the straggler daisy and the um, tube tongue do. It kind of stays where it is and becomes like this, like a set. But where it is, it is magnificent. So we put it, put it in a corner so it could fill the corner. And, and it, it's really a, been, been very successful. You know, we're, we're really happy with it. Now we're moving into sort of the perennial, the other perennials that are a little bit on the medium small side, this is the medium group. They come small, medium, and large as well, which is kind of interesting. This is, of course, fall aster, which brings up another uh, point is that you would, unless you just want it this way, you would want to blend in different seasons of bloom so that there's something going on all the time. You know, you have things like anemone is blooming now. This is going to bloom quite late. Some, many of these are summer bloomers, or they're the spring fall. You know that by, but but you want to, pay, you would like to pay attention to when they bloom, and and that you kind of mix that up, I should say. Uh, the salvias are virtually irreplaceable in this. This is only two of the. I do not know how many hundreds of salvias are out there right now. The one on the left is pretty much pure gregi, that is pretty much unselected. The one on the right is what's known as Mesa Red. And I really like Mesa Red because I like the color and that dark calyx behind and, the, and that really vivid red bloom. This is your hummingbird's best idea. You plant salvias, you have hummingbirds. Now, a lot of these plants are very attractive to hummingbirds, but salvias are brain dead that way. And salvias, especially the Greg Eye hybrids, or the Greg Eye Selection. It will hybridize with Micropola in a big bunch of colors. It also has some color selections, whites, purples, pinks, bicolors, all kinds. You kind of pick and choose the Salvia Greg Eye version that works in your bed. This of course is Ironweed, Iatris, and what it does, not only is it kind of an interesting flower color, beautiful purple, but it's more of a, it doesn't look so much so in this picture, but it's more of a spike. You know, it's sort of more big. Uh, uh, oh, Vernonia. Yeah, it's Vernonia. Well, ironweed, yeah. Um, and uh, thank you, my coach over here, in case, in case I mess up. Uh, but it is a beautiful, beautiful, and it's a very interesting color. As you can see, it's a very rich, royal purple, uh, which isn't really common. A lot of the plants, not only native plants, the plants that do well in the full sun, they're yellow or they're gold, uh, or they're something of that type. And so getting some pink, getting some white, getting some purple in there is really lovely. Globe mallows, the one on the left is the native uh, angustifolia. And I must give you something of a warning with this plant. I, I like this plant, I like it a lot, but it spreads by root suckers and it has no shame. It will spread like crazy. It is an excellent plant if you have erosion problems. Uh, it will hold a slope. There, there are big plantings of it over at Woodlawn Lake for that particular purpose. Uh, and, and we like it, but you have to stay vigilant because next thing you know, you'll have a half an acre of it. But it's really beautiful and it's very, very tough. The one on the right is uh, uh, in Cana, which what we put it in for was those really firm, crinkled, leaves. Uh, it, it's a lovely bloom. That that picture makes it look a little oranger than it is. It's more like uh, sherbet. You know, it's more like dream sickles color. Uh, but, the, but the leaves are that almost white. They're so great and they're very thick and they're crinkled and they make a really lovely mm. contrast. This is one of our Mexican buddies and one of the reasons we put it in is A, it does really well and B, it's very common in horticulture around here. This is Mexican honeysuckle. Now he took a pretty good hit in this in this uh, freeze, which we're astonished at, but he's coming back from the base. And when we were 10 degrees, so uh, so that's really very nice. Oh, I can't read that. Um, okay, more more cheating here. Oh, bloom in July. I don't see. Um, this is a very good summer bloomer, and again a hummingbird plant. Now it, it uh, as you can see, it's a justicia, you know, by the shape of the flowers. And it blooms prolifically like this. This is not an exaggeration. It's usually just smothered with flowers. 
the Miss Flowers. Uh, this one is Greg Eye, which is generally pretty, for us, it's quite low. It really doesn't get up very high. I have seen plants that were much taller. They'll go up a couple of two, three feet. Ours kind of tend to stay on the ground, as it were. I don't really understand that. But it blooms in the in the late summer and fall. And it it's really, this is your butterfly's best friend. There are lots of good butterfly plants in this in this planting, but this is one of them. And um, if you've ever been to Wildfire Farms uh, over near Fredericksburg, and they, they grow this for growing it for seed, and they'll have these big acreages of it actually, and every single flower has got a butterfly on it. I mean, it looks like they're growing butterflies instead of growing this plant. And the same is true of its cousin, uh, blue, also called blue mist flower, but this is Chromalina uh, odorata. Uh, and this is a great plant. This is much bigger. Uh, this one can get about four or five feet tall, almost uh, sort of sort of semi-woody, you know, in that way. There are some beautiful plantings of it at Mitchell Lake. Uh, it's really, really solid plant. Uh, very tough, very hardy, and same attraction to, to butterflies. Queens in particular, but they all love it, so. And then a really irreplaceable member of the hummingbird slash butterfly crowd, but especially hummingbirds. This is Flame Anise uh, on the left, the whole plant on the right, just a close up of the flowers. And uh, this thing blooms, the hotter it is, the better it is. Uh, it's really an amazing plant that way. Uh, it, it will be a little rugged looking in the winters, uh, any winter. It's not at its primo best, but now the hotter it gets, the better it gets. So that's really helpful for birds, you know, and things like that, because then uh, they simply um, flock straight to it. There is a selection known as Benny's Gold. It's a kind of a golder color than this orange, but I'm a little fan of the orange, so what the heck. Pavonia, uh, Texas Rock Rose, Pavonia Lagiapella. Uh, we put this in partly because we love it, but it's also one of the very few pink uh, perennials in this bed, and we thought we could use a little color, you know, I mean, a different color, and that, and it's very helpful that way. We are very suspicious that Pavonia is a kind of a short-lived plant, but I'll tell you, it's a tough one. If you drive down uh, south on, well, it's either 281 or Highway 37, depending on how you look at it, and you're at the convention center, if you get off on that ramp, that hot wall is lined with Pavonia and it blooms like crazy. I mean, so this thing can take any amount of heat, clearly not too happy with the cold, but, uh, and, it, and it blooms a long season and those pink flowers. This is Henry Dulberg. This, uh, this is a selection out of Salvia Farinacea, which is the local native blue salvia. You see it in roadsides and pastures, which is also a great plant for here. But this thing is twice as big the flowers are bigger, the flower spikes are bigger, and the whole plant is bigger. It also has a happy uh, habit. It will reseed. And these aren't hard to deal with. And some of the ones that reseed are white. They flower white. And the white ones, we leave the white ones. We, we have given away all of the blue ones we can possibly find homes for. But um, it's a pretty good reseeder, but, but they're not very hard to deal with. But the white ones we keep, uh, and, and it's a pure white. It's a, it's a beautiful white. This is skeleton leaf goldeneye, uh, a big area. One of the countless plants in the sunflower family that butterflies love. They, they, I'm not sure there's a plant in that whole family that they don't like, but this is a, a very, very good one. And again, blooming in the summer, blooming in the hottest part of the year, uh, often starting very early with at least some plants and then going very late. I mean, it's a long, long season. And you can see that from the, we we're talking about leaf contrast and texture, how it's called skeleton leaf for a good cause. Those fine little thin linear leaves with those bright flowers and the flowers are like this. They're always out in the open, which of course is what butterflies and insects want. This is also a very good bee plant uh, if, if you're not averse to bees, which I'm not. Uh, but it, it, it's really a beautiful thing. Now, sometimes you get height in a different way. Uh, this is the native uh, Craig lily, uh, Echiandia. And the plant, as you see on the left, isn't a very large plant, 
but the flowering stalk is four feet tall. And so it kind of functions in our bed as a sort of midway to the back or an important piece in the front. It's like, it's gonna really get your attention. Uh, and it blooms fair, somewhat later in the, in the year. And those little rocket looking flowers, it's, it's really a beautiful thing. And uh, yes, and, and it is a bulb. Uh, uh, and and it, what, Texas is not rich in the bulb flora natively. And this is one of them. Um, I'm still looking for a few of the others. The cooperias, of course, are irreplaceable and I didn't photograph, they're not in the show, but both pedunculata and Dramundii, both of them, and the white rain lily looking uh, with the long tubular white and the Dramundii blooms in the summer and late fall in response to a rain. And the pedunculata is more of a late spring bloomer. So, but you know, there, there's a few bulbs native. This one is really absolutely outstanding. The same is true. This is Sinalind Senna Lind High Mariana. Uh, I think velvet leaf Senna, maybe they call it. Same kind of thing. The plant itself is a very modest sized plant, but the flowering stalk is very large and very tall and very prominent. There's quite a number of plants like that. And you would place them so that you, it's not the leaves that you're really interested in. I mean, they're good, but they're not what you're interested in. What you're interested in is the flowering stalks. So they kind of go more to the back than the size of the plant would actually dictate. You know, if it was just the plant, you might pull it far. This is right at the back edge of the border, as it turns out. You might pull them in a little bit more, but because of that flowering stalk, they really function better as part of the back, the higher, the taller, the bigger. And again, it blooms quite a good long time in the mid to late summer and on into fall, it's really lovely. And then we get to the really big guys, the ones who really do own the back. Uh, this is the white bone set or white mist flower, agarotina. Uh, and this plant is fascinating. Uh, it's a pretty good sized plant. It's, you know, five feet, four or five feet tall, about that around, uh, and can get bigger than that, uh, depending on circumstances. What this plant is amazing to us is there are butterflies that come to this plant that go to no other plant in the garden. There are we see butterflies, we see the, the usual set as it were, but we see some species that we never see anywhere else and they're on this agarotina and it's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, happy to us, I mean, we enjoy it, you know. Then there's the Aloysius and again, we're, we're talking tall, we're talking six, seven feet tall. The one on the left is Macrostache or the Rio Grande bee bush and it is from the Rio Grande Valley. And you can see that it's kind of a, it really is an interesting thing to me because it's this sort of wandy, wispy bloom, but there's so much of it, it actually is very pretty. It, it works better if you can get fairly close to it. Away from it, it looks like kind of a mist, you know, on the thing. The, the one on the right is the all over the place in South Texas, white bee bush, uh, a gratissima, a loja gratissima, a spectacular plant, it smells wonderful. Uh, and it's kind of a big, multi-stemmed um, shrub, really, or, you know, it, it gets pretty good size. I mean, they can easily get six feet tall. And, and, it, so, and it's pretty robust. And this thing is tough. I mean, I've seen these things growing literally out of rocks. So it's, they're, they're pretty rough. We also planted some, we planted six trees. Because this border is so big, and this is Mexican plum. We planted two of these, one on each side of the, the long border, but at, at the, oh dear me, excuse me, at, oh dear, at, at, the, at each end. So one in, the, one in the front and one at the back. And the one in the front is right outside our dining room window. So that's pretty happy noise. Uh, they're, they're, they're not huge trees. As trees go, they're not very big. You know, they're like, I don't know, 10, 12 feet tall, 12 feet tall, maybe something like that. As you, if you're familiar with these plums, you know, they bloom about now. Uh, with the on bare wood, then they'll leaf out, then they'll have these lovely little fruit, which are edible if you get enough of them and you get there before your birds get them. And, uh, and then in the fall, they turn red. This beautiful burnished red. This is a handsome, handsome plant. The other two we planted were Rusty Blackhaw, same deal. One, in the, one on one side front, one on the other side back. 
And again, just a nice big evergreen. No, it's not evergreen, but I mean, it's lots of dense leaves. Birds love it, mockingbirds love it. And then in the middle, we violated the Soldier Act and put two diasporas. Now these plants function two ways for us. And including this, this is just an example of it. They, a lot of height and a lot of interest and the color and the whole thing and great bird attractors, but they also provide some shade. So that beneath them, you have a new and different kind of uh, environment. And so you can plant some things that are a little bit more shade loving or a little more, more relief See that. Uh, a little more relief from the uh, yeah Texas persimmon. That's what I said, and um, from the blazing sun because it's blazing sun out there. That's for sure. So those diosporas, which uh, uh, Texas persimmon, again another edible fruit, a lovely thing, and, um, and and so they function two ways is what I say. One is that they're very big and they kind of make a nice pop, as it were, and the other is provide the shade in case you want to you know, just increase the number of species because some things just do not like to grow in full blazing sun in the summer. Now, one of the finest ways to get some textural contrast is to use some succulents or semi-succulents. The one on the left is twisted leaf yucca. The one on the right, is, well, it's got his, uh, Buckley's yucca or yucca constricta. Both of these are fairly local natives. Um, occurring just barely west of us, if, if even that, and going all the way up towards Fort Worth up that way. The constricted going even further west. So they're very, very tough. They had nothing in this freeze, not one dead leaf in this, in this terrible, horrible freeze. They too are one of those plants where the plant itself, these are probably two and a half to three feet tall when they're big, uh, but their flowering stalk is huge. You know, it's three times that size and these big, nice white, pendulous flower, flowers on the, both of them, like all yuccas. Uh, so they make an important statement uh, when they bloom. They don't bloom a real long time, which is a shame because they're just gorgeous, but they're really, um, they make a beautiful contrast and they keep uh, some green thing going all throughout the year. Similarly, the unfortunately named devil's shoestring uh, or nolina. Uh, this is the full plant on the left and that's the flowering on the right. And they often have multiple flowering stalks, which is not common. Yuccas don't do it hardly at all. It's very uncommon. It's quite common in this, in Nolinas. Now the flower itself is not anything to write home about, but, but the whole effect is fantastic. And that flowering stalk like that in the condition you see it there lasts for quite a long time. Uh, it's, it's really very handsome. It's when it's pretty hot, early summer, and it really looks really lovely. It's evergreen, of course. So it's another good one with textural contrast and the height of its flowering stalk, uh, depending on where you put it. So that about rounds up plants on parade, I'm just going to tell you. Uh, it's a monarch on the left and a gulf fritillary on the right. And the monarch is feeding on another excellent valley native called Trixus three-fold Trixus uh, that we have found to be a really nice plant here. Uh, you, right now, you either have to go to, you know, a serious native nursery or go to the valley to get it, but it's a really handsome, yet another one of the gold, you know, composite, not flowers, but butterflies really love it, and, and that butterfly likes it a, a great deal. We had originally at one time thought, well, we're gonna, when we first moved the house, well, we'll have a butterfly garden. You know, we'll make money. We had a little spot picked out and we were gonna do it. After we put in this perennial and we have butterflies out the Yazoo all any time after it warms up and in October and September and October, they really flood the place. Uh, you know, I assume in migration is what they're doing. And it's just delightful. I mean, it's absolutely delightful. So that about rounds it up. And uh, now Gary Bowers gets to take over. Uh, and if you have any questions, and thank you very much for allowing me to tell you all about our Tex-Mex border. Awesome, thank you, Mary. Uh, what a- Prettier picture than that. 
What I'd like to do is uh, get you to stop screen sharing. Okay. Stop and, share. Yeah. Got it. And I think that'll help. Uh, we have a little bit of a, a lag sometimes when you were talking. Uh, but I'm sure folks have probably told you you speak a little quickly. So that lag I'm just sorry. brought you it's down to a, a normal speed. <laughs> <laughs> so we have just a few questions for you. Uh, and there's some that are coming in now. Um, so one question, since this is from an anonymous attendee, I'll, I'll ask <laughs> this and see what your response is. Uh, what can one do about one's neighbor's crepe myrtles that hang over one's yard and shade and prevent growth of their native plants? Plant plants that like the shade. I mean, I don't want to be Perfect. flippant about it, but you're not going to get your, unless you can talk your neighbor into pruning their crepe myrtle differently. Which they're probably you're probably not. It's probably pretty tall. My hunch is the thing is pretty big. Uh, then just accept it and and look for plants that really like the shade. And there are some. I mean, you know, there are things like, um, of course, the names will not come to me at the moment, but they will. Uh, Lion leaf sage will grow in anything. I mean, it'll right. grow in any sun exposure. Salvia romariana really loves to grow under shade conditions like that. Um, they, yeah, pigeon berries, calicarpa, you know, American beauty berry. There's some really excellent natives that are understory sort of plants anyway. I mean, that's kind of what they do. And you know, I'm not sure you could ever go wrong, you know, really. And so those are just three or four recommendations. But when you have a situation like that, you just have to kind of go with it. And because not all native plants need full sun. That, that's not absolutely true at all. And uh, so I just go look around for the ones that like the shade. Right. Perfect answer. Turn that challenge into an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, I got a question from Bob Waring. Uh, how much water does your border require? And I'm assuming we mean supplemental water. This so depends on the conditions that are going on. Last summer when it was bone dry in July and August, certainly weekly. Uh, you know, absolutely. Other years where it rains a little bit more consistently in the summer, no, nothing. So it very much, and it also depends on what you want it to look like. Most of these plants, you can let them go and they'll look a little dreary. You know, maybe they'll go out of bloom. Maybe they'll lose a few leaves, but they won't die, you know, from say every other week watering or something like that. Uh, but if you want to keep them in pretty good condition, uh, because it's ornamental, after all, even though they're native. You know, those, it, the temperatures were very high, and it was very dry. And so that was every seven to 10 days for most of them. The things like the yuccas and, and, the, and those guys, they didn't care. The woody plants weren't really so worried. But some of those softer perennials, yes, uh, it, it helped a lot to keep, to keep them in good shape and keep them going. But in a year where you get some rain, Hey, no big, no big deal at all. And in the winter, we hardly ever water it. Okay, good deal, thank you. And we got a question here from, I th probably we're gonna mess up the name, Lena Dion. Uh, what were the trees that you mentioned? Mexican plum, Texas persimmon, and then you had one other. Rusty black haw. And it's rusty black viburnum. haw viburnum. Right. right, it's a viburnum. And it is deciduous. It has really lovely kind of thick green leaves, blooms a little white, like all viburnums, little white heads of flowers, but it's very handsome in the fall. Very handsome in the fall. It, from bright red to a sort of burnt orange red, depending on exactly uh, what, different plants do different things, but you know, something like that. Things that would also work would be red bud, <laughs> vapor ash, things of that. I mean, they would, they would function the same way as the ones we, we chose. And I had another one that came through the chat. Do you trim your rock rows? No, but we probably should have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, uh, we were just discussing this this afternoon is that it probably would have been wiser to have pruned it midway through the year, uh, to be honest, but we didn't and we haven't. We've had it in for, I don't know, three years, four years, something like that. And, uh, it would probably be a good idea, actually. Okay. Um, 
we've got just a few more minutes before we hit eight o'clock. So I'm going to combine a couple of questions. <laughs> um, so we talked a little bit about watering. Uh, do, you, do you have an irrigation system set up or do you do that manually? A hand watering. Okay. His name is Gary Irish. <laughs> All right, perfect. And then, um, so th these are kind of combined a little bit. A little bit about, did you do any soil preparation for? for... Not particularly, okay. but we do apply mulch, uh, especially where the straggler daisy and or the, well, even over top of them, they don't really care. We will put down leaves or mulch or something. Um, never more than once a year, and some years we forget, but that's about the only soil amendment that we really do. And we don't fertilize them. I mean, you know, they just, they're out there. Okay, and I, I have to forgive me, I didn't look up the, uh, the eco region that you're in. Is your soil there kind of stony or more clay? No, we live in the river valley of the Medina River. Okay. So this, this yard, and it is superb drainage. It's, it's a kind of a sandy loam. It's not the richest soil in the world. Because in our vegetable garden and in these, we, we use a lot of mulch, we use a lot of compost, because it's not terribly rich, but the drainage is fantastic without being rocky or, I mean, it's alkaline, but you know, without being rocky or, or difficult that way. Right. We did that in Arizona for 25 years. We, we were done with that. <laughs> You didn't have to get out of break her bar to plant your tree. Yeah, I mean, that was our way of life. Yeah. All right. Um, and let's see. Oh, gosh, they're coming in so quickly. I think we covered most of the preparation questions. You didn't really do a whole lot, but you do mulch. And then um, there was a question here about the plant between the mist flower and the bee brush. I can probably run back through the slide list and find that. In the wet, in the wet, I oh, the flame anise acanthus? Was it orange? Um, that was from an, my anonymous attendee. Hmm. What I have for, between the mist flowers and the rock rose is flame anise acanthus. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I know um, that's a mouthful, but that's what, the, <laughs> that's what it's called. You don't so really we'll, want to know it's botanical day. That's a real mouthful, <laughs> you know. So we'll have that uh, those links for the, the West Texas this, data, so it's pretty good. We'll have the links for the slide list and the uh, selection good. notes, so uh, that'll be posted with the with both our our blog post that will kind of wrap this up. You'll find the link there to the YouTube, and then also in the YouTube description, I'll have links. So uh, right. for my anonymous attendee who asked that question, you should be able to find the list there, and then. One last question, just mm. for fun. An area two feet wide next to a sidewalk and the brick wall of the garage. So almost like a hell strip, Western exposure, mm -hmm. very hot in summer. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one of those. I might get down 12 inches before I hit rocks and construction debris. Those people in the balconies will be jealous of that because they're lucky if they can get down three yeah, inches. That's, that's not a terrible thing. No, so plant suggestions, full, full sun, probably don't want anything stabby so close to the sidewalk. Um, you know, Flame acanthus. Yeah, Lisa acanthus is one of them, uh, for sure, without any doubt. Um, really, we have straggler daisy growing in a situation like that. It grows on its own over there, if you're interested in that. Um, some succulents, uh, cacti, agaves, Certain ones, they do great in situations like that. And they're not, they don't have deep roots. I mean, that's what I think the, the uh, questioner is asking is about 12 inches is plenty for most of these things, like, unless it's a tree or a shrub. Uh, so you should be in really good shape, almost any. Oh uh, yeah, the skeleton leaf golden eye would be fantastic. The, the unselected uh, salvia farinacea, the, what, what's it called? Um, uh, I'm not too good with common names, I'm sorry. Mealy blue sage. Uh, and I say unselected because it's fairly, it's a lot smaller. It's only about a foot and a half, two feet tall. It grows on its own out by our mailbox. I mean, you know, it doesn't care. Uh, things like Tacoma, uh, yellow bells. Yep. There's no such thing as too much heat. 
Uh, so, you know, those kind of things. And that's what you're looking at. You're looking at a lot of reflected heat uh, and you want things that aren't deep rooted. So you don't want woody stuff is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Now, if you move away from the natives, you can get to things like uh, Pride of Barbados, you know, and stuff like that. But, uh, but native wise, that's what I would say offhand. And one of our members also pointed out that Mary's books are great references for finding <laughs> plants. Thank you. Thank you. I have a website that's my name. And so if you're interested in the books, you can find out all the, the, the titles and where to get all the books. So, and I have to tell you, whoever gets the perennial book is getting a bonanza. It's out of print and it costs the earth and back on a uh, used book. I don't know why. It's not, it's a good book, but it's not that good. And, uh, uh, but it's out of print. And so you're getting something pretty good. And I like that book. <laughs> it's a great book. Awesome. Well, Mary, thank you so much for your time. Uh, to point. all the attendees, thank you so much for the participation uh, with the comments and the feedback. Again, if any of your friends were not able to join because we hit our attendee limit, uh, we'll have the recorded session up uh, probably early next week. You'll okay. see that through our blog post. Uh, we'll also show up on our YouTube channel. Yay. All right. Well, Sorry, Mary. I talk. I usually do. No, not at all. Not at all. That's <laughs> why we record them. <laughs> you can change that playback speed as much yeah, as you no, want okay, on YouTube. Yeah, right. no, that's great. I, I, it was a great pleasure. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And thank you, Gary, for the extra help you were offering back oh, there. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone have a good night and we'll see you next month. Thank you very much, Gary. Bye-bye.